Last year I published this book, Live Well, Live Long, Teachings from the Chinese Nourishment of Life Tradition. And um, it's a comprehensive account using the, the uh, principles of what's called Yangsheng, Nourishment of Life, a preoccupation of the Chinese for nearly two and a half thousand years, um, about how to live in such a way as to maximize our chances of being healthy, happy, and living long. And it covers a lot of different subjects. But I say that there are four subjects that are like the four legs of a chair, four key subjects. Uh, a chair is um, stable and strong if it's got four legs. Lose one leg, lose two legs, it becomes increasingly unstable. So the four legs of the chair are first of all, first and foremost, cultivation of the mind and emotions. Um, secondly, diet, thirdly sleep, and fourthly exercise. So this is a talk about that fourth one, with, uh, particularly with the perspective of the, uh, what I hope is interesting and unique and perhaps slightly unusual Chinese view of things. So this quotation, I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at it, this is obviously very old, it comes from the third century before the common era. And this theme is repeated through the centuries um, by different doctors and um, specialists in the art of long life, which is that compares the body to, as always in the Chinese tradition, compares the body to natural phenomenon. And uh, the first is water, simply that if water doesn't flow, it becomes stagnant and then disease can arise, it can, can become putrid. And um, this rather strange one, the pivots of a door are not eaten by insects. And this refers to the fact that doors used to have leather hinges. So uh, they don't get attacked by insects because they're constantly moving. So there's this idea that the, uh, which I'll come back to, um, that the flow of qi in the body has to be free and continuous. Qi has to flow, we'll talk about, or qi and blood specifically have to flow. But I'll come back to that. Uh, now we all know, I think we all know, that exercise is good for us. Um, the government tells us so, um, so it must be true. Uh, this is the government's start active, stay active promotion. Um, it used to be, go under the heading of five times a week. So it was, if you remember, their advice on diet was five a day. That was five, por five portions of vegetables a day. And five times a week was exercise five times a week. Um, so what this document tells us is that regular exercise helps prevent most of the serious non-infectious chronic diseases. Uh, it'll reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, of obesity, of diabetes, of dementia, and of some cancers. And it will um, prolong life. Um, it strengthens the body, strengthens bones and muscles, reduces the risk of arthritis, uh, maintains mobility through into um, old age. And it has quite powerful effects on the mind and emotion. So, uh, regular exercise, for example, is considered to be as effective, as effective as medication for uh, moderate depression, perhaps even severe depression, I don't remember, and also helps with anxiety, raises people's, raises our self-esteem, um, we feel good about ourselves. So there's numerous benefits. Um, and as I said, exercise, regular exercise lengthens our lives. Now the government's recommendation um, if I remember correctly, is we should engage in 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. So that's um, 30 minutes <coughs> five times a day, or 15 minutes a day of vigorous exercise. And then moderate exercise is fairly aerobic. So moderate exercise is defined as exercise after which or during which um, you can talk but you can't sing and vigorous exercises you can neither talk nor sing. So their emphasis is on uh, um, various degrees of aerobic exercise and they don't talk much about slower, quieter forms of exercise like yoga or 
Tai Chi or Qi Gong. Um, it's interesting that 40% of men and women in the UK, 40% of men and 30% of women claim to meet these guidelines, but when they um, fitted movement monitors on their legs to find out if this was true or not, the actual figure was 6% of men and 4% of women. So. <laughs> now, running through all traditional cultures is a very clear understanding of the benefits of exercise. This is somebody I refer to again in this lecture two or three times or in this presentation. This is Sun Sun Miao, um, a seventh century Chinese doctor who is so revered in the Chinese tradition that he's, he's transmogrified into becoming what's called the god of medicine. He's so highly revered. He was a practitioner of the art of nourishing life. He lived to 103 years old. There are many wonderful things I would tell you about him if I had time, but we'll just um, see some of the pithy statements he made. This one, if people exercise their bodies, the hundred ills cannot arise. Going further back to Hippocrates, um, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. Uh, another example, this is Maimonides, the um, great Jewish doctor of the 12th century. There is nothing that can substitute for body movement and physical exercise. Okay. And you probably know Bob Dylan. Um, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. But apparently you do. Well, they did. So this is Jerry Morris. When he died in 2009, the Financial Times uh, said that he was the man who invented exercise. And apparently he invented it in 1953. It, Financial Times said he had inadvertently, mainly luck, stumbled on a great truth about health. Exercise helps you live longer. Okay? So, uh, what did he do that was so spectacular? And I have a massive respect for him. I'm not um, mocking him, just the Financial Times and the whole scientific and medical profession. Um, <laughs> because what he did, he had the bright idea of sending his students out, the first thing he did, send them out to sit on buses and count the number of steps that bus conductors, remember them, um, ran up and down every day. Um, and what he was interested in is comparing their health profiles to bus drivers who just sat there. And lo and behold, he discovered that um, bus conductors had much lower rates of cardiovascular disease and much lower rates of heart attack. And this was published in 1953 to enormous criticism. Um, uh, it was opposed very vigorously um, because um, it lacked biological plausibility and specificity. Biological plausibility means you have to know how something works for it to work. And because they didn't know how exercise worked de facto, it couldn't work. So that was the first thing. And then specificity, they were very keen on taking a single thing like a drug and looking for a very specific action on the body. But they soon discovered exercise benefited everything and that didn't fit the model. So. Um, this was opposed uh, by certain sections of the scientific community only for a while, it's true. He then did a later study on um, postmen and women comparing who, who walked a lot, comparing them to their colleagues who sat around in the office all day. So movement <coughs> versus exercise. This is where I'd like to start looking at exercise. Um, movement is natural, exercise is to varying degrees deliberate. If we think of our ancestors, um, we used to hunt, we used to walk around gathering. Um, when agriculture was invented, we plowed the fields, we pounded grain, we kneaded bread, chopped wood, washed clothes by hand. My old granny washed all the sheets and all the clothes in a uh, copper, you know. 
Uh, we cleaned our homes without any electrical devices. We traveled by foot. Um, and forget training in martial arts. That's a separate thing. Okay. And, and even then, on top of all that, we still found time to take pleasure in running and riding around on horses and wrestling and playing games and, and engaging in sports and, of course, dancing, lots of tribal dancing. Yeah. So, uh, so we moved our body all the time. And this is the baseline of the human body. The human body has evolved for almost continuous movement. I hardly need to point out what happens today. It's perfectly possible and we've all done it and I fear some of us may still do it. <laughs> you know, lie in bed all night, get up, sit down, have breakfast, go and sit in a car or sit on a train or a bus, go to an office, sit all day, come back, sit on the sofa watching television. Yeah, that's very typical. So um, this is the first thing. In fact, the government, those government recommendations, as well as that 150 minutes of moderate exercise, says move as much as possible. It's funny, I found this, again, from the third century BC, as they say, plus a change. Um, going out, one uses a chariot. Returning home, one uses a sedan chair. People love these for the comfort they provide, but they should be called mechanisms that make one lame. So um, Sun Tzu Miao talked about movement. He said, uh, the way of nurturing life consists of never sitting or lying down for a long time. Extended lying down damages the qi. Qi is a very difficult word to translate into English. It's usually translated as energy, which is not really an accurate translation, but nobody's really come up with a better one. It's actually very confusing in Chinese as well. That's part of the problem. If you look in a dictionary, there's about 150 possible definitions of qi. Um, so extended lying down damages the qi, but let's say that damages the energy. It makes us weak and feeble. Um, extend, extended sitting damages the flesh. What that means is makes you fat. Yeah? You sit down too much. Interestingly, of course, he also warned against standing too much. Yeah? So nothing too extreme, everything balanced. And what we now know is that however much formal exercise we do, whether it's the gym, whether it's yoga, whether it's running, um, Long periods of sitting down increases the risk of disease, chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and uh, overall premature death. So the key, before we start looking at what we might call formal exercise, is movement throughout the day and natural movement. Okay? Now I came across a really interesting book recently um, called Move Your DNA. This is basically, you could call it a book about paleo movement. You know paleo, you know everybody's crazy about the paleo diet, which I don't personally sign up to, but paleo movement makes a lot more sense because it basically points out that these bodies we have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years from ancestors who constantly moved. Very small children. They didn't have great big uh, obstructive nappies on, so they squatted and they moved around. They played in the dirt. Um, they wrestled when they got a bit older. They went out, they ran, they climbed trees, they threw spears. The body is, is constantly moving. She talks about range of movement and loading the body in different ways. And lots of the exercise we do, even the good stuff, even the yoga and the qigong, the tai chi, loads the body in predictable ways. It kind of um, actually limits. If you think about a yoga practice or a, a qigong or a tai chi practice, um, however great the range of movement is, and it's much greater than sitting on a rowing machine or on a, a linear bicycle or even linear running, yeah? that range of movement is still a lot less than natural movement. Because think of, think of what's happening when you're climbing a tree or when you're dancing. Think of all the incredible range of movements you make when you're dancing. And one thing she discusses, because she's really into feet and legs, is that when we walk barefoot over rough ground, 
the 33 bones <coughs> in the leg have the possibility to interact with each other in something like 10 billion different ways. And of course, every different adjustment of the bones in the feet will, call, will ripple through the body and cause adjustments in the body. So when we walk in shoes on flat pavements, we cut that range of mo movement down to really tens of tens instead of billions, tens of variations. So she's big, she's big on barefoot walking. One of the problems is that if we haven't grown up with natural movement, in other words, that means most of us, we, we haven't led a, a paleo life, then we have um, bodies that are, even if we look after our bodies but through exercise, we have bodies that certain parts of the body move well and certain parts of the body that are not used don't move well at all. Yes? Um, Every yoga teacher knows this. They can watch people and see how um, they're great at moving certain parts and other parts are completely stuck. Yes? So uh, it's then quite hard to say that we can successfully cultivate the body to its maximum just by walking and running and dancing because we carry that um, disconnectedness in the body into those activities. And in fact, that disconnectedness can be a contribution to injuring ourselves because the parts of the body that move well move excessively and the parts of the body that don't move don't move at all. And the tension between them creates the risk of injury. So how do we restore um, integrity to the body? We can then express and enjoy a natural, more successful natural movement. Well, through conscious practice. Huh? Um, and the Chinese exercise tradition, the one that I particularly want to talk about, and yoga and uh, Pilates and various other things are um, examples of very conscious movement, bringing real awareness into the body. 